At Valdez, the Chinas come in. Always a red-letter day in the life of the town. For the men, it means the first payday of spring, working cargo in the hold and down on the dock. For the women, it brings fresh fruit and vegetables to Valdez, the first they've seen since winter set in. And for the kids, it's always a little like Christmas. They flock down to the dock when the ship comes in, knowing the deckhands will greet them with fruit and candy. It's dusk, almost too dark for good photography. But aboard the ship, two of the crewmen, Fred Newmare and Ernest Nelson, unlimber their 8mm movie cameras, trying to get some pictures of the grinning youngsters and their dogs on the dock below. Then, at 5.36, a dozen miles deep, under the mountains north of Prince William Sound, the earth shivers, begins to move. Valdez begins to empty, drains almost dry. A subterranean chasm opens directly alongside the ship. Slowly, the Chena starts sinking down into it. Soon, only its mastiffs can be seen from the town. The dock splinters, goes down with it, while crewmen try frantically to reach the people on it. Out in the Gulf of Alaska, the ocean bottom plunges, then heaves upward a full 50 feet, and a wave starts racing for shore. It crosses the Sheena high, smashes it down where the dock had been, then drives it into the heart of town. Fred Newmare grabs the deck stanchion, holds on for dear life, and keeps his camera running. on the dock at Valdez will survive. The longshoremen, the kids, or their dogs. Now the tremor builds. Rips like lightning around a 500-mile arc. In Anchorage, The seismic wave hits Seward, exploding the gas tanks, sending people racing for their lives as a wall of fire and water sweeps into town. It strikes Kodiak later. First, a high silent tide. Then a 40-foot monster thundering up the channel, turning town and harbor into a crazy whirlpool of capsized boats and floating buildings. All the clocks have stopped at 5.36. And so has everything else. Alaska's been hit by a natural force equal to 10 million atomic bombs of the size that leveled Hiroshima. The greatest shot to hit this continent within the 20th century. Our town at 5.45. Our town at 5.45. Two people lie dead under the concrete slabs, fallen from this storefront in Anchorage. But a third, Blanche Clark, by some miracle, is still alive inside this crushed car. Already passers-by are trying to free her, before more loose slabs come plunging down. 
Others are rallying, too. At 547, the first mobile unit of racing, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, pulls up in front of the State Civil Defense Office on Fifth Avenue. 307, PGA, you're calling any station. It's an emergency, an emergency. Any station on this frequency? This is JL7, Abel Peter Victor Mobile. Over. JL7, Fred Lowe, you're over. Abel Peter Victor, go to the public safety building. Check the city CD. DRW. You go down the door. Contact. I'm just trying to make contact with this. Robert Zizley, Alaskan warning officer for National Civil Defense at Elmendorf Air Force Base. Alaska Warning Center calling all stations. Calling all stations. Any of those stations that are on, please come in. No contact. This Alaska Warning Center calling all the stations. The quake hasn't knocked out our northern defense. The commander-in-chief, Alaska, still retains full control of his air defense forces through alternate communication channels. But for the moment, Risley's own circuits are out. Now darkness has fallen. At Providence Hospital on the edge of town, an emergency generator has kicked in to keep the hospital alive. All the others in Anchorage have lost power, heat, light, and water. In the next few hours, Providence will be called on to supply emergency treatment for nearly 300 victims of the quake. Among them, Blanche Clark. Rescuers have finally managed to pry the concrete slabs apart, and a settling torch has cut her out of her car. Still alive, in spite of a broken neck and arm, three fractured ribs, and shock. The two military bases at Anchorage, Fort Richardson and Elmendorf Air Force Base, are both hard hit. But as the size of the disaster begins to come clear, Alaska Command alerts military police, medics, signalmen, and engineers, mountain rescue troops. The National Guard, just finishing up two weeks of training at Camp Denali, is ready too. And trucks and ambulances begin rolling out toward the city. In the Gopher Hole, the emergency communication center in the basement at State Civil Defense, shortwave operators are picking up first reports from pilots flying over the devastated areas. Again, we repeat, the entire port facility has just been wiped out. There is simply isn't a port there anymore. The quake has generated sea waves up to 30 to 35 feet at irregular time intervals. Is that correct? They're still unable to make contact with the outside world, not even with the capital at Juneau, where Don Lowell, the state civil defense director, is trying desperately to get through. Well, I have no connections at all, Don, with, uh, with, uh, with Anchorage. Well, you're going to have to fight a multitude. I, I don't know how many of the hands are moving up or what they're doing. At this moment, the entire civil defense staff in this, the largest state in the Union, consists of exactly six trained professionals, two secretaries. On the local level, Seward, Kodiak, and Valdez each have only one part-time worker. The city of Anchorage has none. No replacement for Doug Clure has been hired. But the man who no longer holds the job is doing it anyway. Already, Clure has made a downtown damage survey for John L. Cantor, the governor's aide, and delivered a load of emergency medical supplies to Providence Hospital. Now, in front of state civil defense, he runs into George Sherrock, the mayor of Anchorage, is drafted back into duty. The public safety building at 6th and C is one of the few in Anchorage with emergency power. City officials are pouring in now. So is military assistance. Eighteen minutes after the quake, station KFQD has returned to the air on auxiliary diesel power, begun broadcasting emergency messages, and other Anchorage radio stations are joining in. It is also important 
announce that you do not go into the downtown area. You will not be admitted. The downtown area has been blocked. A first off. aid station is being set up at the old First Federal Savings and Loan Building at Fifth Avenue and Eighth Street. A doctor is needed there as soon as possible. The coronator is desperately needed at Providence Hospital. Darling group, don't sit out in your car. Get undercover now. All structural and architectural engineers for the U.S. District of Army Engineers are to report to room 111, the District of Engineers Building at Owen. The area is a major disaster area. They have no heat, no fuel, no power. At 8.30 in the combat center, Bob Risley begins contact with Don Lowell in uh, Juneau. How many warning points do you have on right now, Don? Nome, Fairbanks, Bethel, Juneau, Sitka, Ketchikan, and Palmer. Then he begins relaying the first civilian reports of the disaster to California and Washington. Roger. Warning center out. Still, no one's been able to get through to some of the missing towns. I presume you can hear me. Is there any indication or sign of fire at Seward? We received this report through the city manager here in Anchorage that both the oil tanks and docks are on fire at Seward. In Resurrection Bay, the oil-soaked pilings are floating like candles in the night. And roaring oil tanks light up the sky at Whittier and Valdez. In Valdez Harbor, the China rides at anchor at the end of an incredible journey. Three times bounced off the bottom of the bay, driven into town and out again. And yet, through luck and seamanship, still alive, afloat. And in the Pacific, the seismic sea waves are running, smashing at the shore. In Hawaii and all along the west coast, civil defense workers and state troopers are spreading the warning. But on a beach in Oregon, Four children are swept away. At midnight, a tidal bore hits Crescent City, California, and another dozen people are dead. But all through the night, the crests keep hitting Alaska hardest. And so does the Earth itself.